Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Coffee with the Critters. For those of you that joined us last week, um, right when I was getting ready to introduce our guest, Emily Cassell, boom, internet went out for a national, I guess it was a national internet. It happened to everybody, not just us. So some of this may sound familiar from last week, but um, at the beginning of every episode of Coffee with the Critters, um, I say a little bit about what we do, and then I do a recap of the past week, which is going to tie the recap of this past week. I'm um, going to tie in heavily and well with um, um, what Emily. What we're going to talk to Emily about um, small animal resources. Um, so let me just say a few things for those of you that are not familiar with us. In the work that we do, my name is Laura Joseph. I'm owner of the Animal Behavior Center. We're an international educational center where we teach people all over the world how to empower animals and the people that work with them, care for them. And we do that through um, our live streaming services, um, focusing on applied animal behavior, the science of behavior, putting it in everyday understandable language and bringing it to people working with numerous different species. Um, so, um, traveling hasn't started up for me again yet. Uh, I don't, Emily has it for you. <laughs> Emily's down in the lobby. She said, no, um, she thinks that, that they're blacklisted down there in Florida. So <laughs> usually when I travel, um, which I travel quite a bit, um, it is focus we'll post it here in the events section um, on our Facebook page. We also have workshops, which we have one scheduled for this month, and I need to heavily consider if we're still going to have that or maybe just reschedule it in the spring and take off running in 2021. Um, so we also have an email newsletter, which um, you can find here on our Facebook page as well. I try to get that an email newsletter out at least once every month. And if you see this photo come into your email um, email inbox, uh, you know you have a newsletter for us and you can sign up for that right on our Facebook page. Um, so before we move on to what has happened this past week, um, some of the things we have that are available on our website um, and through our services um, our level one, which focuses on live streaming with people that have companion animals at home. Our podcasts in there are a huge hit. <clears throat> we do activities. And actually, we just had, Emily, we just had you on in a live stream in level one like two weeks ago, focusing on all the foraging for small animals. Um, so we'll have guest live streams. We do that in level two as well. Level two is more focused towards um, people who are wanting to get into the field of animal behavior training, um, enrichment, um, but definitely not limited to professionals. We also have board certified behavior analysts in there. We have zookeepers in there and we have people that just really want to know a lot more. And we have a lot of group discussions, interviews as well. Then we also get species specific such as the parrot project, the pig project, and things like that. So a couple of things um, that have happened in the past week. Um, this is a photo from last weekend when I had was getting ready to have Emily on. So this is our building. Those of you that know that we're moving out here, the Animal Behavior Center is moving out here to Indian Creek Zoo. We will remain the Animal Behavior Center. We're just going to be on Indian Creek Zoo's property. And this is our building. It's further along than this, but I haven't had a chance this week to take a new photo. So we're looking, I don't know if we'll possibly a move-in date within, let's just say by the end of the month. That's what we're shooting for. Yeah. So we got to get in. The interior walls are going, starting to go in. Um, the front of this is mostly done now. Um, and all the interior windows are starting to go in. This week is going to be a big week for the building. So um, stay tuned for that. Um, 
this past, or no, actually every weekend out here, and it'll start happening more than that. I, just the animal behavior center has to get moved out here first before that happens. Um, I think I've worked every day straight here at the zoo for the past at least 28 days. Um, haven't taken a day off. I will once the animals are moved. <laughs> but um, we focus really heavy here at Indian Creek Zoo on the weekends, Saturday and Sunday. We do a lot of training demonstrations and a lot of enrichment demonstrations. And we do that. People love seeing animals engaged with um, doing things, whether that's, here's the two hyacinth macaws sitting behind me patiently waiting to go outside, um, interacting with a foraging toy. And we stand out there with them and tell people what they're doing, why they're doing it, um, how that mental and physical stimulation is extremely important for animals in our care. Um, yesterday, <clears throat> I went in, um, the Animal Behavior Center um, comes out here, the volunteers come out here a couple of times a week and put together enrichment. And here's the, one of the pieces of enrichment that they had put together for dill and pickles. It looks like a Gatorade bottle or some kind of bottle. Um, it has hay in it with a bunch of different fruits, a couple holes cut out in the side and the complexity came in how it was hung. Um, we hung it up extremely high, so they had to jump up there to get it. But then I was a little nervous about the length of that rope. Um, so we cut the rope, lowered it, and we actually moved it to the side. And um, keepers just kept an eye on them while they were going by um, due to just a little concern about that rope. But there's a way, and we'll talk to Emily about this. Um, no reason for me to go in and explain um, some of these things now when that's why we have Emily on here. Um, something else we did, the people loved seeing this. Um, the black bears out here, sweet pea and jigs. Um, we put peanut butter and peanuts in those holes on that four by four that hung from um, the top of the enclosure. The complexity could come in now where we're gonna move it further inside the enclosure where they can't jump on a shelf or climb up the side of the enclosure to get to it. Now they have to climb up the actual four by four. Um, here's one that we incorporated yesterday, which people really enjoyed seeing. We just took, took a three inch PVC pipe, drilled holes in this. Um, and I actually think this was Mason that made this one. Um, and drilled holes in the side of it, left the top of it open so we could stuff it full of things for no matter what different species of animal. Um, we chose yesterday to put this in with the tortoises and pull tail out through it and people really enjoyed seeing it. And then that gives us the opportunity to tell people how important foraging is. Okay, so this last one, is um this is i believe this is pickles the reason i i'm really big into empowering animals and i'm really big into enrichment and that is the reason i train because studies show if you're actually using positive reinforcement training it's the animal's preferred form of enrichment so yesterday i usually just do encounters with the lemurs yesterday i chose to do a train a public training session. And I was just trying different things to see what the public would like. And while they were watching Dylan Pickles, the public loved seeing them learn something new. And all I was asking was for a hand target. Put your hand to my hand. And when I do this, I can get them to put their hands different areas. This would be a great thing to train for a veterinary exam going in and maybe um, checking the heart rate, things like that. So we're always preparing animals for vet visits. <clears throat> and now with further, without further ado, I'm gonna bring on our guest, Emily Cassell. Um, you can find her on Facebook at Small Animal Resources. You may wanna go to her Facebook page and join and follow now. She has a lot of different information and I could tell you all about it, but that's why she's on here on the live stream. So I'm going to bring Emily on now and once she'll be in here in one, 
right now. <laughs> Hi, Emily. Welcome. Hey, thank you for having me. Thanks for getting up the second Sunday early <laughs> in a row. <laughs> um, Emily was on last week and we had the national internet outage, so I didn't even get to bring her on. Um, so let me go ahead and read your bio first, Emily, so people know uh, what we're who they're talking to. <clears throat> Emily Cassell has spent her training career working with multiple species in various settings, beginning as a pet dog trainer, working both in group classes and in, in the home. She gradually moved on to her current line of work with orangutans, tigers, gibbons, and other species as a zookeeper. Throughout her career, she worked with owners of small mammals by assisting with husbandry, nutrition, and welfare. Eventually, Emily started Small Animal Resources, a consulting service and resource to broaden her ability to help small animals and their people. She has had a special interest in rabbit, be rabbit behavior and has worked with pet owners, rescues, and shelter staff to understand these commonly kept but little understood pets. She has written various articles for the Pet Professional Guild and International Association of Animal Behavior Consultants on rabbit behavior and training. She has also presented on various training and behavior topics for the Pet Professional Guild, Animal Behavior Management Alliance, and the Florida Association of Zoos and Aquariums. So welcome, Emily. Thanks. It's good Thanks. to have you on here. <laughs> um, I met you... It's hard to believe. Was that only two years ago this past April? It feels like it was a long time ago, <laughs> like no, way no. longer than that, but I think so. I think 2018 was that Kanab. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. In 2018, I met Emily um, through the Pet Professional Guild where the Pet Professional Guild had the um, workshop summit out at Best Friends Animal Society in Kanab, Utah. Um, and I met Emily. We did live streams. I did live <laughs> streams on the way to Kanab with all of us in the Yeah, band. that was fun. <laughs> yeah, that was fun because it was all the speakers. Um, Emily was one of the speakers out there and presenters and even training workshops. Um, so we all rode up what was like a three and a half hour drive from Vegas up into Kanab, Utah. <clears throat> and we all talked about the different things, why, how we got to where we were, what our sp favorite animals to work with. And you gave workshops out there with rabbits, correct? Yep. yep. Okay. So let me, let's hear from you. What started your interest in the field? I mean, I know I just read your biography, um, but how did you begin knowing you wanted to work with animals and how, what got you to the next level? Um, well, I've always, I've always loved animals and I definitely, I think a lot of like horse people say you're just like born a horse person. And I'm like, definitely was the little girl that loved horses. I still love them. And I knew that, um, I wanted to work with animals. And I think like when you're younger and you like animals, people just say, Oh, so you must want to be a vet because that's like the only career that you're introduced to like at a young age. So it was like, okay, yeah, like, I guess, you know, that's the thing. Um, but I really didn't until I was, you know, like 10, we didn't really have animals growing up and I would read about them all the time. And I always found myself really being drawn to like the training sections of books. Um, and then as I got a little bit older, like I grew up going to SeaWorld and Bush Gardens. I live like three minutes from Bush Gardens. And um, I was really inspired by the killer whale yeah. at SeaWorld. And it was like, you know, this seems like next level training. And this is, you know, like if I'm going to shoot for something, I feel like I'm going to have regrets if I don't go for this. Because I just would leave every trip to SeaWorld just like completely infatuated with what they were doing. So, um as I got older, I kind of shifted from, you know, like veterinary science, like, oh, there are other animal careers out there <clears throat> and really got interested in training, um, especially when I got you know, my first dogs. I was very interested in training because I like most dog trainers, like we all kind of have like that one dog that kind of like drives us completely up the wall. And then that's how we become dog trainers. <laughs> so that was my dog, Maddie. She was absolutely 
uh, horrible, but um, she was like my soulmate. Um, so she became like the most amazing teacher, my best friend. And um, so she kind of helped guide me, guide me there. And then through, you know, I, I still loved horses. So when I went to college, like that's what my major is in is equine science. So I did the horse thing in college. Um, and then uh, still really wanted to get into the field of zookeeping and um, working with animals. And I have a really strong interest in wildlife photography. So on the weekends, I would go to my local zoos and really love watching people interact and do enrichment and training with the zoo animals. And I was like, I think this is this is it. This is what I want to do. Um, so that because was kind of, of the, because of the variety of species. <laughs> um, I think so. You know, I like, I really, I thought for a really long time that I wanted to do marine mammals. And I thought if I didn't get there, that I was going to like always regret it. So when I was my first internship <clears throat> was with Lowry Park Zoo in Tampa, and it was um, kind of the only marine mammal internship that they had, it was with the Florida manatees and our Florida animal section. I've always really loved like our native species here. Um, and so I did tons with the manatees. It was like a rehab program. It was amazing, like amazing. And just like the most amazing group of individuals um, to work with. And then um, and then a couple, it was like a year, 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 year. Next, the next internship I did was with Clearwater Marine Aquarium, um, working with marine mammals. Um, and I did work with, um, I worked with pelicans too, which was really, really cool. Um, that was like my first real bird experience. Um, and then, um, and then I just, you know, got a seasonal position that turned into a full-time position and I had never wanted to, I'd always said, I don't want to work with dogs or great apes, but outside of that, I don't, you know, I don't really care what I work with because I just love behavior and it's the same no matter the species. So naturally what I did was start out as a dog trainer and now I work with great apes full-time and I can't imagine doing anything else. So you love staying and working with the great apes. I love them. I mean, I work with orangutans and then I work with, I call them lesser apes just because they're smaller, but I work with gibbons too. And um, I mean, orangutans are just, I mean, they're so smart. They're so amazing. They're, they're like our friends. <laughs> so it's really cool just to, um, to get to have that relationship. And with some of these animals that are so endangered, you know, there's not a lot of people that are privileged to be able to work with them and the plights that they face are so um it's it's just horrible like i mean a lot of animals like what happens out in the wild it's not it's not a pretty the wild's not a pretty place and um all that so while i was kind of you know working there and and doing that i was working with um curtis canine kind of on the side which is a um, a dog training facility down here uh, in Tampa and Angelica Steinfeld was one of my mentors and she was talking to me a little bit about a guinea pig camp that she went to and she said you know the the way that the animals were treated was not correct like it was, it was off and some of the things that they were asking her to do that they considered natural for guinea pigs I was like, well, it doesn't make sense because of, you know, X, Y, and Z, like just in my like limited experience having these little guys as pets. And she's like, you need to, she said, people don't know this stuff and you need to make, a, like, put it out there. So that's how small animal resources got started. And then it just, it kind of, I, I feel like it took off most when I got the bunny that I have now, um, was Tula. And I just started to chronicle her journey because I was fostering her and that lasted I think six days <laughs> before I was texting the the rescue and was like, oh, she's not going anywhere. <laughs> she's gonna stay here. <laughs> so I, I tried fostering one time and I was really terrible at it. Um, <laughs> so, um, but people really, I mean, she's a very like cute, like little cotton ball. And I think that, she, you know, she caught people's eye, but then also just following her training journey, I think people just really caught onto it. And then that's kind of how small animal resources, I think really started to take off. So small, tell, tell us about small animal resources. What exactly do you do on there? Do you post like all, all the different things you're doing? with people? Yeah. So or, I, originally it was kind of, we had like a really cozy little following, like a really cozy little like 300 dollar community for a while, which was really, really nice. 
um, cause I felt like I knew everybody really well. And it was, we just were posting a lot of, you know, we had like enrichment things. And at the time when I started small animal resources, I had, um, I had two Guinea pigs. I had a rabbit. I had a fish. I had the dog. I had like a small zoo of my own. So kind of like almost anything that I was doing, I just like slapped it up there and just tried to make an effort to post something every day so that there was always material up there and tried to focus on the guinea pigs and the bunny mostly because obviously it was small mammal center. Um, so I was always putting enrichment stuff up there. I'd always been training and stuff with them. Um, and particularly my first bunny, Hemingway, he was very like, he was just a really sickly guy. He was not well. So, and he also was, I mean, I've never like experienced a training challenge like him. He came from, like my little sister was bringing him home on the weekends from school. He was like a classroom yeah. pet. Um, and, and like, I mean, get this, he was a science classroom pet. They had three rabbits and they were not even confident like what gender the rabbits were. And I was like, maybe you shouldn't teach science. Like it's not hard to tell, but like <laughs> you shouldn't teach science. <laughs> So the teacher like pawned off the animals on all the kids for the summer. And Hemingway was like, she, my sister was in middle school and she said, you know, like a lot of the kids, like, I mean, middle school kids are like, I don't know, they're going through their own deal at that age, but they were kind of, they would like pace him around and kind of harass him a lot. And he was also in a group of three bunnies and he was kind of ostracized from that group. And after I got to know him a little bit more, I mean, it probably had a lot to do with his health issues. Sometimes those little herd animals, they kind of are like, hey, you sickly guy are like a threat to us. So just like stay on the periphery there and they kind of bully him. Um, so he was just like this little like one and a half pound, like he looked like something that somebody had swept under their couch. Like he was just like a ball of gray. <laughs> just you know like not a super attractive like little guy like he was just kind of a mess and um he we had another rabbit at the time who we didn't have space for like everybody so we sent him to live somewhere else he came back and um he wasn't in the best condition when we got him back he had a really bad fur infestation he had some like serious um malocclusion issues which is like a misalignment of the molars um and he had a deviated septum, so just chronic sinus issues, which rabbits are obligate nasal breather, so they literally can only breathe through their nose. So a deviated septum is like very difficult for them to like kind of work through. Um, he had like an infection. I mean, the guy was like a disaster, and I brought him to my vet, and he was like, or she said, you know, this this guy is a mess. Like I don't know, he's got like he was a mess. Yeah, he was a complete mess. And once I got a lot of the treatment that he needed was um, was like painful and invasive because he had skin issues. He needed to be bathed, which you really don't bathe rabbits because they can't regulate their temperature very well because it's all through kind of their ears. And if their ears get wet, it's hard for them to like warm up or cool down. Um, but he was so flea infested, like we, there was no way to get this stuff off of him because it was in his eyes and in his nose and in his mouth. It was just like hideous what, you know, the way that he started out. So once all of his medical treatment was done, I was like, okay, I'm going to like commit to taking like a completely hands-off approach with this guy. Cause I don't have to force him to do anything. Um, and I'm going to build a relationship from the ground up with him and see where we can, where we can get with them. Um, <clears throat> so he, I, you know, I definitely, I've never seen an, another animal that I think was like clinically depressed. Like he just didn't do anything. He didn't care if I like, you know, went up to him. He wasn't like scared or fearful or feral. He just would like sit in one place like all day and do nothing. He like ate barely enough to yeah, to like stay alive. Like I've never seen anything like it. So um, food reinforcement was really difficult to figure out with him. And that's usually a pretty good go-to. So it was, I used to have to chop up watermelon, like extremely small because we had to have his incisors removed. So he couldn't like bite anything. 
and I would have to like just go up to him and like put it next to him and leave immediately because even if I tried to like stand near him while he ate the watermelon it was like too much for him and he would leave so um I learned a lot from him like I've never had an animal that like he made me work for every single bit of relationship you know like those points yeah and those he punished me if I did anything wrong <laughs> so those tougher cases are are often our our best educators our best teachers yeah absolutely mm -hmm. I was so grateful to him and I had like such you know by the end he only lived five years which is about half the normal lifespan of a um of an average bunny um and that's probably because he was you know just medically like you know just uh had a lot of genetic issues but um I mean he was such an amazing little friend like he was such a like we had such a close bond a close relationship and the fact that he like he made me work for like every little bit of it and um it, it totally it made me such a better trainer and it made me really realize that there's you know there's no lost causes there's never anything that you can't try because i've never had to work that hard <laughs> so tell us what are some of the things you did to get that trusting relationship and and how old was he when you got him um he was probably I think he was two. I met him when he was very, when he was a baby, like when he was probably like six, eight months old. Cause that's when my sister started to bring him home on the weekends. Um, you know, like how the kids will trade the pets on the weekends if they're in like, if they're a classroom pet. Um, so I probably had him like permanently when he was two or three years old. Um, but one of the things that I did with him, um, I realized that the very first thing I had to do was to stop making withdrawals from our trust account. And the only way I knew that I had to wait until he was medically okay. Um, cause we, unfortunately we couldn't start from that base cause I just got him as a puddle of mess. Um, so I couldn't train or build any of that stuff right off the bat. And a lot of the things that the treatments for some of his skin conditions and stuff were painful. So I was definitely way overdrafted by the time that I was ready to pull back and, um, he had you know a small like crate that he shifted into every night because he lived on my screened in patio so he had a huge amount of space um but i used to to get him to go in and kind of like herd him in so a lot of you know negative reinforcement like go in here and then go to your food so the very first thing that i did was um i just sat <laughs> and i would just wait like for him to go in because i knew that you know, arranging the environment every night. Um, he knew around this time, like I go in here and then me coming out onto the, the porch was, um, you know, an environmental cue for what was about to happen. But rather than approaching him at all, I just like sat, I like would go, I'd put his food and um, I started working on trying to figure out what type of reinforcer I could give. So in addition to kind of his nightly veggies, I would add in little bits of fruit or carrots, things that um, bunnies would typically, you know, uh, enjoy as reinforcers. And I try to do some preference assessments that way. And the only thing that seemed to like pique his interest was watermelon, which is, you know, difficult to chop up for an animal that uh, doesn't <clears throat> have any teeth. So that oh, was yeah. fun. But uh, it was definitely, it was, it was worth it. So kind of the first thing right off the bat, just stop taking any withdrawals out of the account. And I would just sit and I did a lot of like observing him. <clears throat> um, and one thing that I noticed is we would do, you know, like if we had family things going on, we would set up, you know, the porch with different, like when we'd set up like tables to have like the family over and like eat outside for Easter or Christmas or Thanksgiving. Um, I noticed that he'd be really interested in that and he would, you know, hop around it and interact with it. And so it was like, okay, well, the thing that he seems most interested in is environmental change. So like, dang, how can I use that as a reinforcer? <laughs> like, well, like new things, things changing, different things. Yeah. But like the whole, uh, it was almost like furniture. Like he was interested in, like the entire space being rearranged and knowing what I know now, I think, you know, a lot of people will say, Oh, my bunny really hates when I clean their pen. Um, and 
what I've discovered is they, I mean, their eyesight is terrible. They have really poor depth perception. And so they navigate a lot with smell, but they kind of figure out where everything is with their whiskers and with touch. So they tend to go up and like, when you start to move their stuff around, they're just trying to re <clears throat> remap their environment. I'm like, okay, we're moving this. Okay, wait, this was here. Okay, let me try and figure it out. Cause that's how they can navigate and like figure out where everything is. So I think that he was trying to kind of remap the porch after we moved a bunch of stuff and changed it. So one of the things that um, I had the people do in my workshop, um, which was one of my like relationship building um, workshops in Kanab was do what I call be the human jungle gym, <laughs> because a lot of rabbits, they really love tunnels. And they, a lot of times, if they're first meeting you, they're really relationship oriented animals, which is like really surprising to me. Um, but they won't eat from you right away. So, you know, to get them even to come over and to interact with you, um, I did what I did with Hemingway because I would, when I would sit on the patio for like 45 minutes to an hour waiting for him to go into his pen so that I wasn't like, you know, forcing him or anything like that. I would sit with my back against the wall and just read a book and I would have my knees kind of pulled up. And so it was almost like a little tunnel system behind me and underneath my knees. So I was like, wait, like this, that was the most interesting I ever was to him was when I kind of created like a human tunnel around my own self. So that was kind of one of the, the exercises we did in my Kanab workshop was from my experience with him. Um, and that was really kind of how we got to the initial part of our relationship where he had a little bit of trust to be able to at least explore and like map me out as an object in the environment that was kind of like a piece of furniture. And pairing you with um, not you not forcing him to do anything. Yeah. So he probably picked up on that. It sounds like he picked up on that pretty quick and probably when you had him out running around underneath your legs and yeah, he started figuring things out. Yeah, it was amazing. It was, it probably was a month before he would actually like take food around me. We had to like establish that whole bit first. And I think like, again, like somebody that is depressed, like it's not necessarily sadness. It's just like kind of apathy and like not wanting to do anything. So just like kind of getting him up to do anything. Um, I think that was, that was like a, a component of it. And I can't, you know, of course, like prove that, but I definitely think that that was in the mix there. So, yeah. And him having a history of probably not having a very enriched environment, you know, absolutely. He may not have, he didn't, he didn't know, you know, so you yeah. had to teach him. Um, in a, in a lot of what do you do a lot of teaching of foraging? Absolutely. So, um, you know, rabbits naturally spend, and I would say that this is probably true of guinea pigs and chinchillas as well, just because their diet's very similar. Um, but they, they eat mostly grass. So they spend four to six hours a day foraging. Um, so a lot of the behavior problems that I see, even if they're unrelated to, um, unrelated to kind of the issue that's at hand, if we're building trust or anything like that, um, I usually have my my clients start off with foraging and like get get rid of the bowl, um, and and let's let's create something else. Even if it's a different food bowl, like a paper bag of hay, like this is your new food bowl. <laughs> and when when I mean, when you tell people get rid of the food bowl, do you get looks like you're from Mars? <laughs> <laughs> I usually I build it up with a lot of. I definitely tend to be like somebody who is like I have to like if I'm going to like drop a bomb like that, like I try to give lots of facts on the front end. So I'm like, you know, like I'll explain how much time they spend foraging and I'll explain a little bit about their nutrition and um, the fact that they need to eat a lot of grass and that some of the nutrient dense foods that we feed them um, can actually not, I mean, they're, they're not designed for the bunnies to, for optimum health. They're designed for optimum like meat production or fur production or just like other bunny production. So 
Um, a lot of my clients that get rabbits from breeders, they're, we kind of, one of the first things we address is the diet because the diet is like astronomically high in protein, but that'll be the food the breeder recommends because the breeder is breeding rabbits who, you know, breeding animals of course have higher protein and nutrient requir requirements than our little, um, you know, little couch potato bunnies. So, um, I try to give a lot of that on the front end so that when we have the conversation about foraging, um, the, the people are a little bit more receptive. So usually they're okay with it. The part that is funny that people usually like start to balk at is about a week after we've done foraging and they start to see their bunnies play. And the way that bunnies play, there's a lot of like picking up and tossing things or they like dig at things or shove things. And um, I don't know if it's the fast movement or, I mean, like, I guess for us as, as human primates, like, you know, if you're like slamming something around, that's a form of, you know, frustration for us. So I think when people see bunnies doing what bunnies do, they interpret it as like, oh, well, they're really mad about the whole foraging thing. <laughs> like they, Cause the rabbits are tossing the stuff or they're digging at it, but those are just the tools that they're given. And that's their kind of go-tos for exploring their environment. Okay. That's well, usually where I have to convince people like, no, they're not angry. <laughs> this is just bunnies. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, like when, like, I don't know rabbits, but I don't know bunnies at all. I've only worked with a few of them. Um, but when I start working with an animal, like I love working with zoo animals, obviously, because you have the variety of species. Yes. And sometimes I'm like, Sometimes I'm like, um, um, sorry, I'm watching a turtle. Okay, he's flipping himself over. Um, <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> turtle rescue. Um, I like working with variety of species because I don't know what I'm looking at. I'm like, what is this? And so many times, like you'll work with somebody that says, oh no, this animal is happy. And I was like, well, tell me what happy means. What does that look like? And then when I've even worked with some, um, even people with companion animals that say, you know, this animal loves pistachios. I'm like, okay. So I go out and buy pistachios and I'm sitting there giving it. <laughs> it's not eating it. So I'm like, all right, what does love look like? And could that be because I've provided such a wide variety of, food because that's one of the first things I'll do is provide a wide variety of food so I can start identifying food reinforcers to work with. And sometimes like you're so you're telling, talking about with Hemingway, um, the animal comes from such an, uh, I have a black cast corn bill sitting right beside me. Um, the animals come from such an unenriched environment and uh, they don't interact because they were never taught. That was never reinforced. Um, so finding a starting point is very, I don't want to say tough. It's very challenging, yeah. but it, it, those challenges, those challenges are my reinforcers. Those challenges are ways for me to, <laughs> <laughs> Those challenges are ways for me to start thinking outside the box, you know, like going and working with Snow, because her birthday is this weekend, our deaf and blind border collie. Had I ever worked with a deaf and blind before? No. People are like, how are you going to do this? I'm like, I don't know. I haven't met her yet. I need yeah. to start, observing, you know, and watch what she does do, what she doesn't do, what she does, what she doesn't do that I... <laughs> what she doesn't do that I want her to do. And now people will come in and see her and say, they don't think that she's deaf and blind because wow. animals adapt so well. They adapt and we give, we limit so many, we limit so much of their potential because we feel sorry for them. Don't yeah. feel sorry for them, empower them because they can, Absolutely. they'll adapt. Yeah. Absolutely. That's definitely one of my favorite things about, especially with these little guys. Like people are like, oh my gosh, like <laughs> um, they're like, 
you know, it's so amazing that they can do that. They're like, this one is so smart. I'm like, they're, they're all so smart. Um, and they, we just have to get out of their way and like, you know, help them and be their support system. Um, <laughs> she agrees. <Sorry. laughs> um, one of the first animals that I really, really trained was, um, I had fish and I trained them and I had amazing, I mean, people, what did you say? It was black out there. I said you were training fish, right? Yeah. I said, I love that. I love, go ahead. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's amazing like that. I mean, I think people just don't give animals enough credit for how smart they are. I mean, my first, I had, I had parrot skateboards that I trained with. People are always like, what type of fish is that? Is it some sort of special species of fish that's like extra smart or just like, no, like I picked this one because like I went to college and I was like, I cannot be in this dorm without like a buddy and I could only have a fish. And there was like a uh, aquarium store and I went up to the guy and I was like, hey, this is going to be super weird probably for you. But like, I, and I read Karen Pryor's books and Karen Pryor trained fish. So it was like, I, I bet I can do it. So um, I, I just told the guy, this is going to be super weird, um, but I want to train I want to train a fish. Like, what do you, what do you recommend? And this is all the space that I have. And so he recommended the, this parrot cichlid and I had such an incredible bond with him. And then I had a second one. Um, and my second guy, um, I had him for nine years and he was, I mean, like the most amazing, amazing, like the most amazing relationship. Like, and people just don't think that you can build that with, animals like fish and people are like, wow, he's just like the smartest fish ever. I'm like, there's probably so many like him that are that smart if we just like would stop and like look at them. And I used to tell people like if Russell had lungs and four legs, he would be far more loyal than like any dog could ever hope to be. Like he was just like, I mean, just and amazing, I, amazing. I think that's why it's extremely important for you and I to be doing the work that we're doing. You're a pup, you're a public educator. Um, I mean, do when we get out there and train these animals and show like I love training the alligators here. They are my favorite animal here to train, and it is Emily. I'll tell you what it is causing people to travel distances to come to this zoo to see this alligator That's training, amazing. and it just makes the hair on my arm stand up because people are like, wow how long have you been training these gators and um are you sure they're coming to you because you're calling i was just like yes and i'm target training <laughs> them to an area to an object um but it gives people um the appreciation yeah for the species and like with you uh people watch the work you do um it could cause them, will you tell us a little bit about orangutans? So we, that information that comes from you, that you specialize in working with these animals, you can tell the public um, their status in the wild and it opens our eyes to, hey, maybe I need to be donating to some money to conservation. What can I do? Will you tell us a little bit about your work with them? Oh, I would love to. Um, so orangutans are, you know, people say that, you know, oh, orangutans share 97% of their DNA with us. We we share 97% of our DNA with orangutans and we were very privileged to do so. Um, I started working with orangutans seven years ago and um, I used to not want to work with great apes because I thought that they were a little too much like people and that's 100% right. And that's why I love them so much. I mean, we, they, they are us. It, it's, it's like, it's so mind blowing. It's so incredible. Um, and it's devastating to think of what happens to them where they're native to. So they're native to two islands. Um, and I think that, you know, I'm not hundred percent sure, but I'm pretty confident that their historic range, like most animals was much broader than two islands in Southeast Asia. Um, so they're native to the islands of Borneo and Sumatra and they are, um, they they live in rainforests and the rainforest is the most biologically 
diverse ecosystem on the planet. So when we save the rainforest, we save not just orangutans, um, but we save so many animals that we haven't even discovered yet. I mean, I think it, it was, it's super recent, but I think it was just like two years ago, we discovered there was like a third species of orangutans. And it's like, how do two we not ago? even know? It's a great ape that we didn't know was out there. I mean, two years ago, like two or three years ago, I think like 2017, 20, I'm getting so mixed up, especially this year when you can't even tell what day of the week it is. Yeah, no. um, but it's mind blowing that we didn't even realize that there was a, like there's a great ape that we didn't know about. Um, that is so cool because that also lets us know there's so much we don't know. There's so much we don't know. And it's just so crazy. And there's new animals. I mean, they say that we are losing animals faster than we can even discover them. So, you know, we, we've not even like, like we don't know what we don't know. It's just crazy. So orangutans are threatened by a couple of things. And one of the main, um, the biggest thing that that harms them is the destruction of the rainforest and the number one export of the region southeast asia where these guys are native to is something called palm oil and palm oil is in like everything we use it's in candy it's in cosmetics it's in you know just like 50 percent of the things you're going to buy in the grocery store whether they're food items or things like deodorant and shampoo it's going to have palm oil in it. So um, it's, it's in so many things and it um, grows particularly well um, in Southeast Asia and it's the number one export of that region. So it is a crop that they grow. And what's happening is you have companies that are, um, you know, they're trying to produce palm oil so they clear the rainforest and they cut it down and then whatever's left over like stumps and all that kind of stuff um you know they they burn it down like they call it a slash and burn like burn this stuff down um and the orangutans have nowhere to go and um the orangutans are also threatened by black market trade like most endangered species are so if you have um an orangutan mother like with a um with a baby they will take the baby and in the same way that you know here in the states like we would go to the mall and there's somebody who's reaching out and trying to like straighten our hair or like do our cuticles or whatever at those little kiosks in the mall if you go to to um those types of places and those markets and stuff in Southeast Asia, you're going to have somebody who's trying to pull you aside. Hey, come get your picture taken with a baby orangutan or a baby monkey or baby gibbon. Um, and these babies are traded on the black market for that type of stuff. They're kept as pets, as status symbols. Um, and a big problem for great apes is that um, their hands are in the same way that people have they poach elephants for ivory or rhinos for their horn um very weirdly great ape hands are status symbol for some cultures so that there's many motivations for harming these guys as individuals and then harming their habitat as a whole and then combine that with on top of this habitat uh, or this place where these guys are living um is a bunch of peat swamp and it has a really high carbon level so when they burn the rainforest down they are releasing tons of carbon into the atmosphere and increasing the effects of climate change which doesn't help any ecosystem anywhere so it's really it, it, it impacts all of us very much so you know the next thing is like well what do we do most people know that you know most of us aren't going to travel to southeast asia especially not right now um so of course you know, avoiding those types of interactions with baby primates and stuff. You know, we say, you know, orangutans are, of course, not monkeys, they're apes. Um, but we say, like, the only person that needs a baby monkey is a mama monkey. Um, taking these animals from their mothers, especially myself having witnessed, like, the bond between them. I mean, like, it, like, it, it's, if you think about it too much, it'll, like, destroy you. Like, the, the idea of taking these babies from their mothers is, like, hideous. Um, but 
palm oil is something that we contact every day, multiple times a day. So the best thing that we can do is be sustainable shoppers when we are at the grocery store. And the Cheyenne Mountain Zoo makes this amazing app for your smartphone or tablet. Um, and if you go into the app store and you search palm oil, it'll pull up right of apps. I'll pull my. I'm gonna do that. Well, come on in. Uh, um, you search for. Hey, thank you. <laughs> oh, Amanda just got me a coffee. Thanks, Amanda. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> So go to the app store and search for for palm oil and it'll pull up a variety of apps that are free to download. I'm going to see if I can like accurately show. So this guy right here, like a one mirror situation. Yep. Um, it looks like a little, little green guy there. Um, and of course the reflection is on it, but it basically has a list of products and brands that are orangutan friendly. So, um, the cool thing about the app is it's kind of more of a link to a database, so you don't have to update it like you do with other apps. Um, and what you can do is you can either look up the product by name or you can um, you can also um, use the barcode scanner that comes with it. The tough thing about the barcode scanner is that if you scan something that does not have palm oil in it, so like let's say like you, I don't know, like scan a pack of hot dogs or something. Um, it's not gonna have palm oil in it. So it'll say like, oh, this product is not quite orangutan friendly. Um, and basically like it's a little bit up, uh, it can be a little bit confusing at that point. Um, so it helps to look at the back of the label and see if it contains palm oil, palm kernel oil, palmitate, palm stearate. It goes by a million different names because now that the word about palm oil is getting out, um, there's a lot of these companies that are lobbying to kind of diminish like transparency in the labeling and they change the, they market the, the substances so, multiple different names so that you can't find out what it is um, that's in them. So, oh, so they're intentionally labeling, labeling it so you can't find it. Exactly. So this app is really helpful because you don't have to learn all 37 different names of palm oil, basically. Um, so when you open the app, you can search again by name or you can barcode scan and it will kind of give you like very easy, like a red, uh, yellow, green, just like a stoplight of the product and how friendly it is. And what they're basing it off of is the company's level of commitment in the round table on sustainable palm oil and the round table on sustainable palm oil is a um, organization that basically um, works to increase transparency of palm oil in the products so if a company is 100 percent transparent about the, the time that the oil palm gets from where it is to the product and is doing it in a ecologically responsible manner they get a green light and typically the red and the yellow lights are for less transparency so the best option is always a green product but even a red product they're at least a member of the rspo so that's better than nothing um and that's kind of that's kind of how the app works now like if you're getting something like toothpaste that like you can't like just not brush your teeth um you can scan the app or scan the, the product at the grocery store. And if it says this product is not orangutan friendly, you just put it back and get a different brand. And it's becoming easier and easier to shop orangutan friendly. I've been using the app for about seven years and it's easier and easier to shop orangutan friendly. And when you do shop orangutan friendly, you're helping out not just orangutans, but the whole rainforest. They've just become the poster child for this crisis because they are critically endangered, all species of orangutan. Um, no. Is so that, um, that, yeah, no, I mean, that's a big eye opener because I know in the eight, when the parrot community, um, like I've been aware of is palm oil, the red palm oil. Uh, is it, I don't know there was different colors. So there's different uh, types of it. Well, I just know that, um, like 15 years ago with parrots, um, 
I don't know if there's different types. Um, it was like, everybody was like, search for the red palm oil. And I used to buy it because I was just like, oh, this is great for parrots and our diets. Um, then I was aware that it started affecting, you know, the species of the, the orangutans and their life. So everybody became against buying red palm oil. And I would say that was probably 10 years ago. So I'm just asking, is there a difference between red palm oil and palm oil? It um, sounds like the concern may be somewhat the same. If if, if there is a difference, might, yeah, I'm not I'm not sure because I never heard of that. But um, you know, if it's farmed sustainably, then I then it's that's kind of what the the app searches for because palm oil in and of itself is actually for all the things that we use vegetable oil for. The oil palm is actually one of the better plants because it produces more oil per plant than something like soybean oil so if you were to boycott palm oil and just get things that used something like soybean oil instead it would take much more like space to grow the soybean oil so you need you need basically a lot more space to that you would have to clear to get the same amount as you would for from the oil palm is that am i explaining that well does that make sense yeah, yeah. um so i think you know if the if the company is using palm oil and they're they're transparent about, hey, we're growing the oil palm not on like old rainforest land that we burn down. Because um, the oil palm actually grows better in the grasslands that are adjacent to the rainforest. So I think a lot of companies are utilizing that. I definitely I haven't looked too far into that, but um, I know that the plant is supposed to grow better there okay. than elsewhere. Okay. So um there's pro there might be sustainable sources for that red palm oil if it if it is good for the parrots yeah um so we, i mean we pretty much just stopped and we just use we use coconut oil so i guess it's just a we need to be aware of what we're getting where we're getting it from and what impact it has on the environment um emily i feel like we could talk for hours i mean i would love to have you back on maybe we go a little deeper into talking about orangutans can we sure. yeah okay uh, it's it's we're coming up on the hour um and my battery life is it starts gave me a warning <laughs> that you better plug into an outlet soon so um emily i can't thank you enough for coming on uh coffee with the critters thanks so much for having me <laughs> yeah, it's been an honor having you on here. So just to wrap up, you can find Emily on Facebook. Um, do a search for small animal resources and join and follow as like I do. You can also get in touch with Emily by emailing her at smallanimalresources at gmail.com. Um, and if you like um, the things that you had have seen here, this is what we provide, um, very similar but more detail in our memberships and projects, in our uh, level one membership, level two membership. You can find this information on our website at theanimalbehaviorcenter.com. We also have species specific, um, so people tie those into their memberships. Um, some different perks we have, like we've got uh, Bennett Hennessy getting ready to come on in the Parrot Project. I have yet to tell people about this um, on research of the Lear's Macaw. Um, hopefully we're working on getting him scheduled in right now. We had Emily in in level one. I'd love to have you back on here to put more public awareness on Coffee with the Critters. Um, another perk of our memberships and projects, for example, um, if you go to our website, theanimalbehaviorcenter.com, you can um, purchase our webinars. We have webinars on a variety of species, on behavior. Um, another perk to the Parrot Project is all live streamed, parrot-related webinars are of no charge. Um, we have the Pig Project, all live stream pig related webinars are of no charge to people that are in the pig project. We also have webinars on uh, topics such as um, the fallout of coercion and punishment, um, identifying reinforcers, reinforcement, 
Um, we have a lot of things. Um, we also have our referral program. So every five people that you refer to the Animal Behavior Center that sign up for one of our projects or memberships earns you individually or your organization a free one hour consultation. And with that being said, thank you, Emily. Thank, thank you, you everybody so for joining another um, episode of uh, Coffee with the Critters. Emily, thank you again. Thank you so and much, Laura. Yeah, as soon as I hit end, it's going to disconnect us, Emily. Okay. So I'll get in touch with you via messenger. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Have a great uh, Labor Day weekend. All right, you too. See ya. All right, bye. See you, everybody.